Good day, my name is Sharice and I am from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. This week we will be going through Core Talk 9, which is on the origins of life. Previously, we looked at the Earth as, the bear, as a bare rock and determined that it would be too cold. We added a static atmosphere and ocean and determined that the greenhouse gas effect would make the planet too warm. We then determined that circulating atmospheres and oceans will help to stabilize the climate and make it more bearable, closer to what we have now. We also looked at continental drift, as well as the Milankovitch cycles and how they affect our climate and how our climate changes. We are now at model number five and we will be looking at life. So to understand how we got to where we are with our modern theories on how life began, we have to first understand the ancient theories and early scientific theories on how life first came to be. We will then go on to understand how we have developed our modern theories of how life on Earth began. We will also try to understand how South Africa is special in the story of the origin of life. So what is life? It is not the meme, but we will enjoy it anyway. Um, when we look at life, we learned about the five characteristics that define life, which is growth, reproduction, movement and res respiration, and regulation, also known as homeostasis. If an organism could do these five basic functions, we believed that they were alive. This is the common definition we were taught when we were in school. An example of something that would be considered living is humans. An example of something that we wouldn't consider hum uh, living under this definition is a virus, and yet it is a biological organism, and it has some functions or characteristics of life, but it doesn't meet that definition. So, before we get into our modern theories of life, we have to understand where it all started. We will briefly look into our religious and cultural beliefs, and then early scientific beliefs. We will not be focusing on the cultural or religion, religious beliefs too much because the whole point of this course is to focus on the science behind it. So in the Brahmic religions such as Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and even Rastafari believe that God created the universe and life in seven days, whereas in Hinduism, People, it is believed that the trinity comprising of the deities Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva created, preserved and destroys the universe respectively in a cyclical manner. In the Zulu culture, it is believed that the Ancient One was born out of the sea of reeds after which he created everything that exists. He also passed on knowledge to the Zulu people. Zulu people believe that life is eternal the Kalakali sand believed that life, all life, lived under the earth with the great master and lord of all life. During this time, he had planned all that exists now, everything that we see. For the purpose of, purposes of this course, we will not be focusing on these beliefs because they are not based on our observations, they are not testable and are not evidence-based. So one of the earliest scientific theories that was proposed was spontaneous generation, which is the idea that with the right ingredients or the correct recipe, life could be produced. For example, leaving meat out would produce maggots and leaving dirty laundry around would produce mice. People believed this for thousands of years until a, a man named Rudolf Virchow in, 19, in 1858 proposed the idea of biogenesis, which is the production of living things from living things. So six years later, Louis Pasteur's experiment was done and actually supported the idea of biogenesis proposed by Rudolf. In this experiment, he filled two flasks with broth and broth was used because it is it has the nutrients to allow bacteria and other microorganisms to grow. He placed the broth into a straight neck flask and a swan neck flask and then sterilized it using a flame. He then left these flasks exposed to air and the elements. And what he found was that in the flask with a straight neck, microbes in the air managed to get into it and they, they grew. 
in the flask with the swan neck, microbes were trapped in, in, in the swan neck in the curve and were not able to get into the broth and grow. He then took the, uh, the swan neck flask that bacteria did not, bacteria and microbes did not grow in. He broke the neck and left it to be exposed to the air and what he found was that microbes grew in it. So microbes need to enter the broth in order for them to grow in the broth. So life is needed for life to continue and thrive. But where do all these species come from? So this is where Charles Darwin comes in with his theory on the evolution of species. While in the HMS Beagle, he made many observations. And the basic idea that he came up with is that all species have come from one species or that all species comes from some other species. So there has to be one original organism that diversified and led to everything we see now. This makes our hunt for the origins of life a lot easier as we don't have to find where each and every species came from. We just have to find that one original species that everything came from. So instead of looking for millions of origins, of origins for everything, we just need to find the one. So in this animation, we can see how one organism can evolve into another more complex organism until it evolves and evolves and evolves into something different, which eventually leads to us. And of course, our most important invention, the cheeseburger. So one of the main um, outcomes of evolution is photosynthesis. And the reason that I say this is because Photosynthesis has changed the earth in such a dramatic way that if it didn't happen, we wouldn't have the diversity that we see today. And we won't have the kind of life that we do today. So how did the very first organism arise? We have three modern theories. First, we are going to look at panspermia. Then we're going to look at the RNA world hypothesis and the primordial soup hypothesis. But before we get into that, we need to understand the history of life. So the Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago, and the first evidence of life is seen in fossils that are around 3.5 billion years old. So fossils are really rare and hard to form, so we know that the first life emerged sometime before that. According to isotopic evidence, we now know that life formed somewhere around 3.8 billion years ago. So in that period is when we have the first life forming. Between the, the first basic life forming, the very simplest organisms, and the first cells with the nucleus was much, much, much longer than it took for the first life to form on the planet, which only took a billion years, but it took almost two billion years for a cell with a nucleus to form. After that, life began to evolve rapidly because it took a mere one million years after that, more or less, it was just over a million years for dinosaurs to evolve. As mentioned previously, the first evidence of life were fossils from 3.5 billion years ago. These were fossils of stromatolites, which are fossilized bacteria that form sheets on top of each other, which forms these stromatolites. They were the very first, they may not be the very first cells, but they are as close as we can get to what could have been the first cells. So where do we think the very first cells come from? Because this isn't how life began. This is the first evidence of early life. And the answer is, we don't know yet. But we have some theories on where, the, where life came from that led to these first cells. And the first theory we will be looking at is panspermia. And I'm not saying that it was aliens that brought life to Earth, but if panspermia is real, then was aliens, but I didn't say that. So the idea of panspermia is that life from elsewhere in the universe could have been on a rock, on a comet or a meteorite that crashed into Earth, seeding Earth with life. So, you know, it's getting hot in the comet, so <laughs> don't take off all your clothes, but you can take off all your ribosomes. So we believe that life on Earth could have been delivered from 
planets like Mars. So in order to test whether this theory is even possible, with especially with the Perseverance rover landing on Mars, we don't want to contaminate Mars with bacteria from Earth. There was a mission Tampopo or da dandelion in English, which was an experiment to see if bacteria can survive in the extremes of outer space. What researchers did was that they put bacteria known to be resistant to radiation on panels on the space station and um, they left it to be exposed to the elements and what they found was that in these samples the upper layers died out and these upper layers of dead bacteria protected the ones underneath and this is fascinating because these results prove that just a one millimeter di diameter of bacteria could survive up to eight years in space. This is amazing news as it makes the idea of panspermia possible if there was a ball of bacteria just eight millimeter, one millimeter on a rocket it could travel for eight years in, well not on a rocket, on a meteor, it could travel for up to eight years in space. So we know that life can survive the conditions of space but what we didn't know is if these bodies that are going to be carrying these organisms are going to enter our solar system from outside of space. And that was a problem with this theory until two extrasolar objects entered our system known as Omaomao and Borisov. This fueled the idea even further, making it a possibility. However, there are still many unquestions, unanswered questions such as could the life survive the entry of these comets into Earth because it's really hot in there and they probably are taking off their ribosomes. So maybe it's possible, maybe not. But if it didn't, um, if life didn't first or originate outside of Earth and it did originate on Earth, we have a couple theories for that. And the first one that we will be looking at is the idea of it evolving in a primordial soup. So the idea is that primitive Earth's atmosphere didn't have oxygen, as we know, but in Earth's early oceans, we had the right chemicals or compounds to give rise to the very first biomolecules. We had ammonia, we had methane and potassium salts. With the right reactions going on, it could form the first biomolecules, such as amino acids. And Miller Urey's experiment proved exactly this. So Miller Urey's experiment simulated conditions that were seen on early Earth. They had water in a in a little vial that represented the early oceans, containing the same um, elements we compounds we discussed in the previous slide. They heated the water, which would then form what would have been the primitive atmosphere. They had a electrical spark with simulated lightning in storm clouds that would form at the time. And they, they then, then condensed it to form well, precipitation back then. And they analyzed the water that was then formed. And what they found was that it contained organic compounds such as amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. So this is great. We now have amino acids, but this doesn't explain how life could form. It's good to have the proteins, but what is going to continue to keep the cycle of making proteins going on? And that is where our third theory comes in, which is RNA world. RNA is a really fascinating molecule that can do so many things, and we are going to find out why in the coming slides. So in order to understand why it is so important, we need to first understand DNA. And DNA is a biological mo molecule that contains information that codes for our, the proteins that has all of these, um, does all of these ama amazing functions in our body and basically makes us who we are. So once we understand how DNA functions, we have a whole other dilemma. And that is that you need DNA to code for proteins, but you need proteins to read the DNA code. So it's like a catch-22, like a chicken or the egg problem, which came first, because you need both to make each other. As you can see in the next animation, it is very complicated. You have DNA, you need a protein to unzip it and form the messenger RNA which will then have tRNA uh, molecules 
to put the amino acids that are being coded for by the DNA. And these amino acids will then fold on each other and create the protein molecule. Problem is, you need DNA to make proteins and proteins to make DNA, which is a really, really big problem. And could both DNA and proteins arise by chance? Maybe, but the likelihood is kind of low and maybe not entirely possible. So this is where the magical molecule of RNA comes in. If we have our prebiotic or primordial soup, somehow mRNA happens to be the first molecule that is formed. mRNA is special because it can function as both pro um, DNA and a protein. So it can carry information on its strands because it is made up of very similar uh, molecules as DNA is made up of. But it can also fo function as a protein as it can fold in on itself, as you can see in this animation. So it can, co it can store information and it can act as a protein. It solves our problem, right? Kind of. But it's the best idea that we have, one of the best ideas we have so far. Now we will now... We will now look at why South Africa is special in the hist in the story of the origins of life. So, I have heard of stromatolites being the first evidence of life for many years, and I thought, wow, that is impressive. And I only knew that it occurred in Australia and it's fossil, so it's not living. I was surprised to find out that we are so special that we have living stromatolites in South Africa, which can be found in um, Port Elizabeth. And the thing that makes us so special is that there are only 12 places on the entire globe that has living stromatolites. This makes South Africa extremely special. Another reason that South Africa is special is because we found fossils of cyanobacteria dating back from 2.9 billion years. This is amazing and it is really hard to find. It, 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 this is, is one of the oldest confirmed evidence of microbial life. So moving on, what is the truth? We have looked at religious ideas, we've looked at early scientific theory, and we looked at modern theories. And the thing is, we don't have enough evidence to support in, fully support any of these theories as to where life originated. And I don't, I personally don't think that we'll be able to figure this out in our lifetime, but I have hope that we are going to have enough evidence and data to figure it out in the future. And that is what I'm sure a lot of you who are still studying could possibly work on. What we can do is appreciate how unique and special life on Earth is or could be, and we need to do our best to preserve it and not destroy ecosystems. So to summarize everything we've covered in this lecture, we have seen that there is evidence on life on Earth based on fossils and stromatolites, which are fossils as well. We have determined that the panspermia theory is possible because we did see, um, observe extra solar objects such as Oumuamua and Borisov. Those are two of those. One is a comet, one is an asteroid. Um, the Muller-Urey experiments support the idea of um, the primordial soup. We also know that RNA world is possible and it can be a method of how life originated, but we don't know any, we don't know which of these is the actual way that life on Earth originated, or if it, if these are the only theories, we could have theories in the future. We just have to hope that science gives us answers in the near future. So in the next uh, talk, we will be looking at water and what makes its properties so important for life on Earth as it is the only real requirement for life to evolve and function.